this evening, uh, this retreat, in fact, is an opportunity. I've been uh, sharing my insights with you over the past few days, and uh, uh, not to brag or anything like that. <laughs> But when you've been pursuing something for 40 years, you do. You know, it, it hasn't been a waste. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not disappointed. With the <laughs> As I often feel very fortunate because, because uh, coming from a society where, you know, Buddhism was not part of the expectation of my parents and <laughs> I was brought up as a good Anglican and uh, and yet uh, the good fortune uh, what they call bar me maybe or whatever it is to to have uh, come across uh, teachings of the Buddha and then having opportunities to practice them for so many years, so that they, you know, they, you know, to not the, the thing that attracted, that that reached me, and when I first discovered Buddhism was the fact that of its practicality, it's not a belief system, and having been brought up as a Christian, you know, when I started. In, in my adolescence, when I started questioning uh, the doctrines, Christian doctrines, and and realized I had to believe in things that didn't make any sense to me, and uh, so I, I couldn't do it. The mind just found it impossible to to just believe in things that that uh, actually didn't. I found. Uh, I couldn't see the point of even believing in them. And then there was always this pressure, you know, of going to <laughs> hell or being punished for being doubt, doubtful, not believing. But also, having a skeptical nature, a, a questioning nature, then I, I, I somehow, uh, with all the, the intimidation of going to hell if I gave up Christianity, <laughs> I... I just uh, thought, well, if God is going to send me to hell for this, maybe I don't want to go and live with God because he's, <laughs> he's a terrible tyrant because my intentions are good. You know, I wasn't just being bloody-minded or seeking, you know, in, an excuse to commit crimes and do evil deeds. So in trusting your own intention, you know, like the, so many people suffer from from fear and, and fear of being punished and they might be wrong and, and maybe the, you know, the mistakes in their life they're going to be punished for, for those kind of things or for, you know, torturing your school teachers or whatever. <laughs> Whatever terrible things you've done in the past, and uh, <laughs> of course, this uh, you know this is the uh, this is the uh, the thinking mind, and we can always create doubts. You know what is what's going to happen when when we die? Uh, what do Buddhists believe about death? Do you do you go to heaven or hell or nibbana or? just oblivion or whatever, reincarnation. But notice that, that the way I'm, I'm reflecting during this retreat is pointing it at always at the present. You know, it's not theoretical knowledge. I'm not asking you to believe uh, on, on anything that I'm saying as some kind of, you know, that I'm telling you what you should think or how you should practice. But it, uh, an attempt to 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 awaken, to to inspire you, or to give you a confidence that in the ability to realize truth, you know, it's it's your 
it's your human right. It's it's an it's something that's natural to us. It's not you're not finding something you know in outer space, something so far out uh, that the ordinary human being couldn't possibly expect to realize nibbana because it's you know that's for Superman or special kind of human beings. And so you know just by the Buddha's first sermon of the Four Noble Truths, he's establishing a teaching that's been carried on for 2,550 years based on just the most ordinary human experience of, of dukkha or suffering. It's ordinary, nothing, nothing like having been, been tortured or, or, I mean, this is suffering too, but you don't need to, to go to, ha- to have extreme suffering, just the suffering of ordinary middle class, Comprehensive school. <laughs> you don't even need to have attended the public school to realize. <laughs> In fact, it might be be more difficult. But the ordinariness, is, is the sense of ordinariness. Now, that's not inspiring. We say the ordinary, is it? <clears throat> because the the society we live in is always looking for the extraordinary. You know, the really the peaks, the heights, the the success, the the best. You don't want to conquer Mount Everest, go to the highest peak. You don't want to go to an ordinary mountain. You can't <laughs> brag about that. I've climbed Glastonbury Tor. <laughs> So you laugh, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So notice that the the sense of yourself is built not on 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 or on recognizing the ordinary, but on comparing yourself and seeing yourself in extreme terms. So even if you think you're an ordinary person, it, it, that's more or less, um, you know. You, but you don't. You, you're almost ashamed of it, like it's something not to be proud of, and something, you know, you're not you're not extra special like others are. Now, now looking at at the uh, the uh, because we admire, you know, the celebrities, isn't it? We, we they call it the celebrity culture now because it's quite kind of untalented, boring people <laughs> become celebrities. <laughs> so just having your name in the papers and being con- called a celebrity is, is making one special. If everyone was a celebrity, it wouldn't mean much. <laughs> Now the, um, su- but then we're looking at suffering not, even though it's ordinary, it's, a, it's what everybody experiences in their lifetime. Uh, it's still, you know, it's, it's usually something that we, we turn away from, we try to get rid of, we run from, or, you know, we think it unfair that we have this idea we should be happy as a kind of, continuous uh, emotional state of just being secure and happy is, is but that's an extreme isn't it this very the nature of this very realm is insecure it's all about change there's nothing stable in it what we seek security in is always changing <clears throat> and when we really investigate the, the, the sankharas or phenomena you know, the, and so this this changingness is is uh, you know the ordinariness of insecurity, 
of uncertainty, of not knowing, <coughs> where in the the desire is to know, to have answers to questions and solutions to problems. To know who we are, we want to know what, what, who am I, and what is my role in society. What, ha what will happen to me when I die? Where do I belong in the world? Do I, you know, there's, there's a lot of questioning going on about, you know who your your ancestors or country of origin or whatever am i am i american or british this doesn't bother me at all because i don't really care but <laughs> i could make a problem about it an identity crisis <laughs> now the awaken awaking this mindfulness awakenness is not doesn't have any nationality or anything like that, and and so it's it's not in in trying to define yourself anymore. So you don't need to to define yourself and and have a name for yourself and 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 all that. But you 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 just need to know what is not self. So when we we use this word anatta, sape dhamma anatta, yes, sape sankarani, all conditions are impermanent, sape Tamanata, all the truth is not is not any kind of personal thing, is not self. So this sense of a self <coughs> we create. You, you as I've been said many times during this retreat, uh, you create yourself, your identities. And and just notice this in your own, you know, how you what you think you are, the, the things you you identify with like nationality, class, gender, race, social position, uh, talents, sexual inclinations. All these things become identities that define us, you know, religion. What, you know, are we we find ourselves according to either you know, Theravadan or Mahayana or Zen. Now we can see that this is this is that the sense of a person, a separate person, is uh, is created through not, not not that any of these identities are wrong and you shouldn't do it, but. <clears throat> really start questioning, are any of these things really, any of these identities really, and you really, you know, when you really look at them, they're, they're really nothing much. And if you, if you identify, if you become obsessed with some identity, then, then you're always threatened when it's being, when, you know, when it's being condemned or being criticized or, or people, you know, have prejudices or aversions or, opinions and so we you know like just like identifying with the aging process then we you know one becomes an old person by identifying with the with the age or you know with um, you know like uh, in the monastic life like the Buddha established the the Sangha and and so he, he established the bhikkhu, bhikkhuni orders. And these are not <laughs> these are not kind of worldly titles. <coughs> they're they're alms mendicants. They mean you, you depend on the kindness of others. So it doesn't have any any kind of class identity. You know, you're not kind of a priesthood or you're kind of held up above working class or farmers or the rest. Because any anybody, you know, idea idea was that anyone uh, who is healthy enough or whatever can can become a monk or a nun. And so, but then the bhikkhu can be another identity, you know, another <laughs> because people, you know, in in Buddhist countries, you get so much respect, you almost feel like you're a high priest. <laughs> 
And so if you're not careful, you you know, you start thinking you're, you know, you identifying with, with being an alms mendicant. But you don't think of it as alms mendicant, you think more of it as, in fact, a lot of bhikkhus don't even bother to go on alms route anymore. Because they can stay in their air-conditioned cooties and And uh, people will bring them the the food that they want. But how to use these these titles, these names, and, and you know, in order to to not be attached, you know, not not to create more identities or being senior. You know, even the monastic sangha. You know, I'm I'm the most senior monk, and. And I'm the abbot, or things like this. You get, I'm the ajahn. I'm the, uh, you know, you can, you can become very attached to, to being senior to somebody else. You get, you get. It's funny how this, this monastic life brings up certain most silly uh, reactions. Uh, like you can get very upset if a junior monk. Uh, goes before you in the food line. (laughs) 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 Because any any of these conventions are kind of addictive and they give you a security, you know, of this is how it's done and everybody follows the rules and and when anybody, you know, there's any loose cannons or any oddballs, you know, they they sh- rock the boat and take everything <laughs> up. <laughs> well, then the, this is suffering, isn't it? So even being a senior monk and and a teacher and and all the rest can you know if grasped and identified with is still suffering, not not liberation. So liberation then is through awareness, awakenness, and through understanding. Uh, all the you know all conditions are impermanent, which is not to be grasped as an idea, but to be in to be noticed, tested out, see if you can find any permanent conditions. So when you uh, in, you know like in Satipatthana, uh, four foundations of mindfulness, it's all about investigating phenomena. You know, so on, from coarse phenomena to refine. Now, when when we talk about stream entry or sotapanna, now these words, there's four stages. Uh, when we talk, when we chant in the sangha, the salutation of the sangha, we talk about the four pairs, the eight kinds of noble beings. These are the blessed ones' disciples. Such ones are worthy of gifts, worthy of honor. <laughs> and so everybody wonders, what are the four pair of the eight kinds of noble beings? And, and <laughs> we chant it every day. What what does that mean? And so, but this is about uh, what we call stream entry. The first one is called stream entry or sotapanna. And then sakatarkami is once returner, anakami, non returner, arahant. You've completed the course. <laughs> <laughs> now these sound like, uh, you know, if, uh, stages that one wants to attain, doesn't it? And this is how the, the thinking mind works. And we all go through this when we first, you know, when we, you know, because that's how the, the, the thinking is. Uh, thinking is hierarchical, isn't it? It's linear. Good, better, best, bad, worse, worse. That's just the way thinking operates. You can only have one thought at a, at a, in a moment. You can't think the same thought simultaneously. Now that seems obvious, but, but we're so used to thinking, so caught in the thinking process, that, that we try to think our way to enlightenment, or, or we think about ourselves endlessly, and, and about our faults, or seeing ourselves oftentimes through 
uh, our critical mind, you know, the, you know, dwelling on, on the flaw or the imperfection or the, the fault, and and tend to exaggerate our one's own kind of faults or flaws. So even on a personality level, people are are very tend to be a very self-critical, you know. So because we can find so many flaws in in you know I can find all kinds of things wrong with me on a personal level emotional level I can you know it's just the way my mind works and then the the full the faults and the flaws <laughs> I can become obsessed with and ignore the virtues and this is in Thailand uh, Ajahn Chah uh, insisted that I recollect my virtues. I never thought of that before. You know, I was 33 years old, never thought of, you know, I always thought that would be like, like, um, assuming I'm really good. It's like bragging or boasting. Infl- it might inflate me, my ego, if I start thinking, oh, I'm virtuous. And they, well, oh, I'm a sinner. I've done some pretty bad things. I've got all these faults, and that's like being honest, aren't I? Tell me, tell me about yourself. Well, I'm I'm a virtuous, uh, good-hearted. No, you're not. Tell the truth now. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you, oh my my faults. You think he's really, you know, he's honest. He really tells you the truth. Because I, I might tell you about all the flaws and weaknesses that I that I can recognize in myself. But in in terms of developing self confidence or self respect, this is another thing that uh, you know, like people have criticized. Uh, I've been criticized for teaching like I do. Uh, and for teaching about anatta, non-self. Because some people think that, well, before you have a self, you can let go of, you have to have a good self, a proper ego. And and then you might go through years of psychoanalysis just to to develop a good sense of yourself before you can let it go. <clears throat> well, maybe it doesn't take 20 years of psychoanalysis. You know, it was fun, like, like, uh, just in, in the Buddhist terminology, like, dana, si, they have this sequence, dana, sila, bhavana. And so, dana is a kind of generosity. Now, this, this develops a sense of self-respect when you're generous. You know, when you share what you have with others, being generous is a kind of, you know, when you, when you love to be generous, you, there's, that's a, you can you start respecting yourself more than if you're just stingy and selfish and self-centered. You know, so if one just lives for me and what I can get and my rights and my interests and uh, and and not develop generosity, then then you can, it's not worthy of respect. I can't respect misers or selfishness in others. Not to mention in myself doesn't mean I don't experience selfishness. But it's not a quality that I respect or that I want to uh, cultivate and, and develop. And then sila is uh, like the, the uh, morality. Now, as I was saying before, this morality in this sense is, is taking a responsibility for one's life. Now, there's something very, I respect in that. I don't respect people in, in, you know, that are always blaming everything for, you know, the victims of life. You know, I didn't get a chance, and my mother never really loved me, and all that kind of thing. Even if it's true, you know, but there's something kind of noble and inspiring about somebody that that uh, takes responsibility. Okay, from now on, I'm I'm responsible for how I live, what I what I do. And then that, that is, uh, you know, I find I respect that when I see it in others and in myself. 
And when I lived a more dissolute life before becoming a monk, you know, where in uh, the early 60s, you know, living in Berkeley, California, uh, uh, there was a kind of freedom, you know, where you could, you were given license to more or less do anything you felt like. <laughs> and uh, then so it was all kind of fun just to, you know, the idea that the philosophy at that time was experience everything. You know, no holes barred, no moral boundaries. Just do what, you know, follow your desires wherever they take you and see what happens. And so, I mean, that, that was kind of, you know, when you're young, that sounds quite tantalizing because a lot of po-faced adults, you know, he's saying, don't do that, and don't do that, and then suddenly you're, you're kind of, I can do anything I want now, free. But the result was, uh, you know, it, a lack, I, I developed uh, a lot of uh, self-hatred just by, following desires and and just doing anything I felt like. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like being free and free spirit, you know, and filled with love and, and all the best that, that one was expecting, but just a sense of kind of increasing self-contempt. So just noticing in the in the structure of, of, of Theravada Buddhism that these very basic uh, uh, st stages like Dana Sila are quite important really in just the living in the world, living in society, learning to uh, respect yourself even though you, you ha there is no self. <laughs> but that doesn't mean, you know, that's not the excuse and if there's no self then why bother to respect something that doesn't exist. But you don't know that. <laughs> you, see. you still live in a society where the self is is is, uh, is totally believed in and one's committed to, you know, me and my rights and my feelings and everything else. That uh, seems very personal, my identities. Now in bhavana, which is uh, you know, which means bhavana means cultivation of awareness. So notice the first two about living in the world in a in a useful way, you know, in a way that that on a worldly level, if you want personal happiness in the world, then dana is is a way to do it, you know, generosity and and morality. And then, in spite of all that, with having self-respect, there's still something missing. Because the, so the bhavana is where you see through the illusion of self. And now, the, the sotapanna is the first stage, uh, you know, where you break through the illusions of self. So, in, the, in these four stages, there are ten fetters. Now, this is a very clear map, actually, that's in the scriptures. I didn't make this up. <laughs> so this is this is Orthodox Theravada, you know. So and so the ten fetters are they they're, they're called sanyojanas, and they're. They're like men, they bind us to, to delusion and, and uh, to suffering, these fetters. So fetters like a manacle or <coughs> something that, uh, handcuffs and things like that, straight jackets, they kind of hold you and, and, and uh, bind you to unsatisfactory conditions. And so the first fetter is uh, Sakyaditi or the personality view. So this is the this this believing this this unquestioned allegiance to the sense of yourself as a separate person, uh, your identities, your uh, and so forth are are a fetter. You know they they prevent you from seeing or realizing nibbana 
or realizing the path, the 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 freedom that because these notice that the sakya ditti is is something you acquire after you're born. And and it's all about thinking and attachment to memory. So just the just the pronouns, me and mine. I am uh, Ajahn Sumedho, me, mine. And these pronouns reinforce this sense of me. What am I getting out of this? What about me? And this is mine. And I am uh, a noms medicant. I am a Mahatera. Now these are conventions that we use to communicate and live in the conventional world. But now with bhavana or cultivation or meditation, put it into that common word, meditation, real meditation begins at stream entry. The, you know, before you... <laughs> otherwise you can get kind of samadhi experiences, but not you don't see the path. You can't cultivate, you can't bhavana till you see through the first three fetters. Now the first three fetters are all about cultural conditioning, personality view, and thinking. Language itself. So these are human human creations, aren't they? They don't, they aren't kind of floating from the heavens above. We create language, we create, we identify with culture, with social conditioning, uh, and with uh, the sense of myself as a as a man or woman or Buddhist or Christian or young or old. These are you have to think these words and then they and and believe these words is what I really am. You know, this is this is the real me. And the the body is another one, isn't it? The strong identity with the body. I, you know, recently renewed my passport and then and they asked for a, a photograph of my face on the passport. So the face is very strongly identified with. When you look in the mirror, you, you know, you, you, you look at a reflection of your own face. And they never ask for, you know, I've got another unique characteristic at the opposite end, a big foot. <laughs> and they never, they won't let me use that in my passport. <laughs> and that's quite unique. You know. <laughs> big swollen foot. So, um, let's noticing the face, you know, the, the, and, and how we strong uh, they identify with it or criticize it. When you look in the mirror, what happens? You know, you, you start noticing your complexion and... and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you get this age, you don't like to look in the mirror anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but when now when in in bhavana then meditation we're actually you know when we're doing this you know in the morning like observing the body now we're 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 aware of the body as experience now rather than as uh in terms of identity identifying with it it's a different different way of looking isn't it you don't have to even see your body. You can close your eyes, but you can still feel it. You know, it's it's, uh, it's obvious. It's sitting. It's like this. It's you know, it's hot or cold, or the the clothes you're wearing are pressing on it. Maybe your belt is too tight, or you know, you, you're feeling all the time. And this is being aware of the body. It's not creating an ego, but just recognizing it as conscious experience. The different way of, of experiencing your physical body. When you look in a mirror, <laughs> then it, then that arouses the critical mind and vanity. You know, because we give so much importance to what we look like and and what we wear and on and on like that. Because that's, on the conventional world, that's society and the expectations we have on, as, on, on the ego level. 
<clears throat> so the the when I think I am my body, my body is. I wish it were <coughs> this way or that way. It should lose <coughs> weight and should. And then I create a sense of of myself. I become this person with this body. But if I if I aware just with pure awareness then the body still is is operating still what it is but i'm not thinking about it in terms of me and mine it's like this i'm not comparing it you know with ideals or or you know with, with somebody else but it's just the way it is you know this, this is this is what i can know here and now is the body is like this and and so there's no it's not an ego it's not you're not creating a sense of ownership of it you're beginning to to recognize it realize what it's like to to have this human body the way it is you know it is it is a continuously changing you know you're you we're always having to move it or feed it or do something with it and you know, for a whole lifetime, we've spent so much of our life just trying to keep the body from being too unpleasant. <laughs> because it's always, you know, never you, you when you bathe it and feed it properly, you, you can't stay that way for very long. Because this this round the body is like this, the sensitive form, and so many things impinge on it: the temperature of the room. Uh, you know the 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 drafts through the windows, the the uh, you know the aging of the body, the the uh, temp, the uh, whether you're feeling um, pleasure or pain through it, or you're hungry or thirsty. Its functions are like this, and so this is a way of, of breaking down the, this this sense of it being me and mine it's a it's 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 phenomena it's it's just like the having a human bodies like this and then say with the uh sense of myself as a person this is thinking of i am ajahn Sameto. well i uh, you know that this is a conditioned identity i wasn't born thinking I'm Ajahn Sumato. In fact, the first 32 years, 33 years, Sumato was not even in my consciousness. Not a different name. <laughs> <clears throat> but I am, me and mine, these are, these are the thought patterns and identities. And, and so, just not, now, in, in order to see this, you know, you pay attention to what you're thinking, not in a critical way, not to say you should or shouldn't think like this, but really think, you know, be egotistical, be completely egotistical and vain and self-obsessed, but listen to it. You know, that's what I did. I listened to to my, to the, my ego. Because just trying to get rid of it doesn't work. That's another ego again. <clears throat> so, in in its uh, you know, oftentimes its absurdities or its uh, its its uh, obsessions, its moods, I would listen to it. Like listening to uh, you know, like watching television or listening to somebody talking on the other side of the fence. And I began to see, you know, how if if I do, if I stop thinking and identifying with memories and that, if there's just pure awareness, there's no self. Now I use this when I refer to this uh, sound of silence. I, I don't know how many have noticed it yet. <laughs> 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 I keep bringing it up because it's very useful because it does it's the it's the only real way to stop the thinking process to be able to to stop yourself thinking and just proliferating with, and analyzing about Buddhism or meditation or anything 
And if you, you begin to notice this, this, this resonating sound stream, it's like a high pitch or you know, it's an almost electric buzz. And um, it's it's all the time, you know. It's not it's not like uh, uh, people just don't notice; they aren't aware. Or if they do, they oftentimes think it's tinnitus or something, some kind of ailment. But I began to notice this in, in my first year when I was a samanera. Uh, began to observe this when I. Uh, you know, just uh, being alone for so long, I, you know, I just suddenly the 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 thinking would stop, and I I just noticed this. And if I stayed with this sound stream, it's quite peaceful. Though I didn't know how to use it then, but I certainly became aware of it. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, uh, before I even met Ajahn Chah. Then over the years, you know, experimenting with it, you know, I, uh, especially here uh, in England, it became, you know, I remember we lived in London for the first two years. And I remember walking down, we lived in uh, in Belsize Park in northwest London. And I remember one afternoon walking down Haverstock Hill, and uh, and at this time I was in a terrible state because uh, the people that had invited me to England, the English Sangha Trust, they were having a terrible uh, acrimonious battle, which I was in the middle of. <laughs> and it's the last place I wanted to be was in the middle of something. You know, I didn't I didn't know what I was getting into when I accepted the invitation. So I arrive in London and find myself in in, in a, a conflict between two two sides in this uh, English Sangha Trust, and you know, and it brought up all kinds of feelings, and I wanted to go back to Thailand. I thought, I want to go back. Stand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want, I didn't come here to, this is just worldly rubbish. And <laughs> I became averse, you know. But then, but then I remember walking down Haverstock Hill and then suddenly, it's like this sound of silence attacked me. And literally, it's like it just overwhelmed me. Uh, right on Haverstock Hill, which is a rather busy road in London. Mm. And then I, I thought, this is it. Just stay with this sound of silence and see what happens. So that was in the first year in living in, in of all places, London, on a busy street, across from a pub. <laughs> so, so then over the years, developing this, because it, what it does is once recognized, then it, it, it uh, it stops this, this this proliferating tendency of thought. Now, I'm not trying to get rid of thought, but but if if you don't know this, then one just thinks, 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 and you acquire so much information about Buddhism and read so many Buddhist books. And there's so many Buddhist teachers and Buddhist traditions, and and not to mention other things. And there's all kind. Of, you know, here is a supermarket of. Uh, of re religion, New Age philosophies, and everything else. So it's not that there's, you know, it's, it's uh, so many choices, options, opportunities for all kinds of things. <clears throat> so this does affect us, and then we, we find some, you know, we get confused, we get inspired, we, we you know, somebody comes along, you know, that says, you, you should do it this way, or you should do it that way, and 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 we, you know, what are we to do? And there's so many things coming at us all at once. And, and just trying to solve it on that level of picking and choosing among the options. You know, you, you know, it doesn't, 
you know, you can develop, maybe you have an inclination or preference for one over another. And it's good to follow that, whatever you feel most at ease with or attracted to. But still within that, even with Theravada Buddhism, it's clearly stated as, as it is, so there's so many opinions about how to practice. And so, you know, again, should you get the jhanas first and then you've got to get fourth jhana before you do vipassana and then there's, you don't need the jhanas, just need mindfulness and on and on like this. There's arguments. I hear on the internet there's kind of discussions worldwide on, on whether you need the jhanas or not. And what is this, you know, what does this do? And, you know, this, this is still thinking. And, and, you know, do you, you know, do you need the jhanas or you don't need the jhanas or whatever? This is still proliferating of the, of the intellect, isn't it? Is there, do you need to take a stand on, on that level? Or orthodox Theravada? You know what is when they talk about orthodox Theravada, and and so I don't think I'm considered orthodox Theravada. I'm a bit on the what radical side, maybe I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how people look at me, but <clears throat> because uh, there's a certain way people hold the, the Theravada teachings and interpret the scriptures. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but the, what I'm pointing at is the attachment to the convention, the identity with it, with a with an intellectual opinion about practice, about yourself, about Theravada, about orthodoxy, about meditation or whatever. All good stuff, you know, nothing, not criticizing, but, but this, as long as you've not it, 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 you're operating from Sakya Ditti, from the ego, from the self view, you're never going to get it right. You're still, at the end of 40 years, you're not quite sure whether, whether it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> or am I, have I attained Srinatri or not? <laughs> now, these are these are not titles to identify with, because the you know, I am a three mentor is is the Sakya Ditti, isn't it? It's, it's using that word Sotapanna with with the pronoun I. Is that how to use it? I don't like to use it like that. I wouldn't, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. To, to see it in that way, or think I'm not a sotapanna, or I am. As people ask me, they say, what have, what have you, what is your attainment? And they say, 40 years, Zaiba Bhajan Shah. What, have you attained anything? And then I say, well, I don't know. <laughs> are you a sotapanna? Well, um, Are you an arhat? <laughs> well, <laughs> <clears throat> no. That that always is referring back to Sakya Ditti, Sila Bhatta Baramasa, Vichikija. Now those are the first three fetters. Now these first three fetters are artificial things we create. Human beings created. So it's the Sakya Ditti is your ego. You create yourself by identifying with with your memories and thoughts, views and opinions. Sila Bhattabharamasa is the second one and that, that's oftentimes clinging to, translated as clinging to rites and rituals. But I expand that because it's clinging to conventions. Clinging to the conventional, the, the, the conventions of even Buddhism. Attachment out of ignorance to even Buddhism itself is Sila Bhattabharamasa. And then Wichikija is, is the Pali word for doubt. Doubting, uncertainty. Now, 
Doubting is the result of thinking. You know, when you think, you doubt. Am I a sotapanna or not? Well, I don't know. I, mean, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I dare. I don't know if I even want to be because then if I go around telling people I'm a stream emperor, you're really setting yourself up to be knocked down. <laughs> so you must mention calling yourself an arahant. But that is that that is that doesn't make sense in terms of of dhamma, identifying with these stages. And yet, it four pairs the eight kinds of noble beings. What are they? You know, what is that? When we when we're paying respect to the sangha. And so there's there's two stages to each level. So there's uh, sotapanna. <coughs> Maga Sotapanapala, the, the path, you see the path and the result of practicing that path. So, and then the Sakata Kami Maga Sakata Kami Maga. There's, there's four kinds, eight pairs, <coughs> no, four pairs, eight kinds. Now, what does that do to the, to the mind, the Sakyaditi mind? You know, it's rather boggling mind. Figuring out maga, pala, path, and fruit, and and stream enterer, once returner, non returner, and perfectly perfected. You know those are words and descriptions and definitions. And as long as we we try to figure that out on that level of thought, and 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 identified with have I attained or achieved any of this, you'll get nowhere. Either you you can be crazy sometimes and think you are uh, arahant. I've done that. After intense meditation, I come out and I'm just completely enlightened. <laughs> and I think I'm an arahant. In fact, my third meditation lesson, I thought I was an arahant. <laughs> I thought I'm really a fast learner. Three three men, three lessons, and I'm there. I thought it was going to take years, <laughs> and only to find out that I wasn't. You know, it was a so you know. This, that's why these fetters, these first three fetters, I intentionally, deliberately investigate them, so I know what sakya ditti is, not through just following. Uh, scriptural definitions, but actually investigating that my ego, the sense of myself, my my fears, my doubts, my uh, self criticisms, my memories, identity with the body, with the position, and whatever. Don't be afraid of it. You know, not it's nothing. You know, just to get to know the ego. The Sakya Ditti is like this. Now, getting to know that, then stopping the thinking process, because then you, when you stop thinking and, and identifying, thinking about me and mine, and am I or am I not, or, or that, then, then you, there is consciousness and awareness and discernment. Now, that is not Sakya Ditti. That's not the ego. It's pure consciousness. Pure and inte it's intelligent. It's not. It's not. A, I'm not in a trance or a zombie or unconscious, con fully conscious, and awake, attentive. <clears throat> and I I notice this uh, sound of silence. It's like this. <laughs> then by um, developing this, resting in this sound of silence, because it's, it's everywhere all the time, once you begin to recognize it and appreciate it. You know, when it not, doesn't, you know, when I 
in middle of London or anywhere, you know, I can, I'm aware of it right now, talking. I can, it doesn't, I mean, I have to notice it while I'm talking to you. Because it's like the space, and the space is still here, isn't it? Even if I'm talking, I'm be aware of the space. So this is like the background, or the ground of being, and put it in these terms. Or the unconditioned, you're beginning to just, this is the unconditioned. I say, oh, I've realized the uncon. no, you can't do that. <laughs> like you did you again. There is no self-congratulation in this practice. <clears throat> you know, there's no, there's actually no attainment. So people say, well, you've been a monk 40 years, what have you attained? And, uh, Nothing. <laughs> now that could sound really depressing, kind of. And he spent 40 years celibate and got nothing out of it. <laughs> what a tip. Or, you know, talking in terms of, of, of Dhamma, it's, you know, what the re realization of letting go, isn't it? It's not attaining. And so it's a totally against the whole way of the world, the world that is based on the ego and convention and belief and attachment and achieving and proving yourself, you know, proving yourself to be, be successful or get the prize or be the winner or be somebody. So at the end of your life, you say, well, I've, you know, I've done this and I've done that and I've, you know, done all these wonderful things. I must be somebody. But in, I mean, in the holy life, it's the all exact opposite of that. It's not attaining, or, but letting go. Not through resisting or, or annihilation, but through understanding the way it is. So then also, you know, getting beyond your own cultural conditioning. You know, assumptions you make, we all come, you know, from our social and cultural backgrounds, we all form assumptions about ourselves and the world we live in. So you have our ethnic biases or attitudes, you know, that, and we sometimes, you know, we oftentimes misunderstand people from different ethnic backgrounds or religions and whatnot because they aren't making the same assumptions. And living in uh, monastic Sangha here in England, it's very international. You know, you're getting people from all over. You know, we're not a common kind of, all from the same village in the Midlands. <laughs> from everywhere. <laughs> and different age groups and so forth. But this sound of silence then is a common factor. It's the ground of being. It's not ethnic. And it helps you to see what, you know, even assumptions you make, unconscious, unrecognized attitudes and subtleties that, that we, that are so part of us, we, we, we can't get any perspective on. So we tend to misunderstand or create prejudices or whatever uh, or form views about others that are based on on assumptions, cultural assumptions we 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 have we're holding to. Now, from this empty point, when we're talking about emptiness or this stillness and the sound of silence, and this is not personal and it's not cultural. So then you begin to 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 see. You know, you do, you can let go. You you aren't bound to cultural conditioning, social conditioning, or to the way you, your personality operates. You're not, you're not limited and bound by the, what you think anymore. You found liberation through awakened awareness, intuitive awareness. So then this is the path, this is the this is like this, from this point. These three fetters. It's like when you when you really, 
investigate those and you have the insight into, you know, seeing them for what they are, you know, you don't. You, you can still work in the conventional world and operate, uh, you know, in the society as, uh, better than ever. But you're no longer uh, limited by that, by the condition. And when you're not limited and, and identified with the changing conditions and fears and desires, then you don't suffer. The suffering is all about, you know, fear and and anger and resentment and and uh, jealousy and, and being attached and being judging and critical and 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 having preferences and strong views and so forth. We cre- endlessly create you know, kind of miserable mental states and anxieties and worries haunt human consciousness everywhere. So then, the, the, like stream entry is like this is like you, you see this, you know this. This is this is real. This is this is not assuming anything from you know from overestimation of yourself because you 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 actually know the self, the sakyaditi. You know what it is, and you know that this awareness is not self. I don't create, not, it doesn't have my name on it. And so then, then through this, this is called insight, knowledge, uh, discernment, or panya. And this, and then from this you cultivate this, this way of awareness. And then the rest takes care of itself, as you see, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the path, of liberation is actually blocked off by the first three fetters because the all these are artificial identities the the ignorance and the uh, ignorant attachment to these conditions just keep us in this in this vortex this whirling vortex of samsara we have no no way of seeing it or understanding it we're merely kind of caught in its movement So this is for your uh, consideration and reflection.